Welcome back. Information systems management. What are we going to talk about? Knowledge management, KM. <coughs> you may hear these terms, KM, knowledge management, IM, information management, DM, data management. Well, like, what is the difference between all these? I think we've talked about data management quite a bit, but now well, let's go, going to focus on this thing called knowledge management. Let's get into this. I like this saying by uh, David Snowden. He's a Dave Snowden, uh, chief scientific officer for uh, Cognitive Edge. He says, we always know more than we can tell, and we always tell more than we can write. Why is this important? Why? Because think about it this way. When I am dead and gone, everything that I know goes with me. Doesn't exist, won't exist. Everything that's between these two ears won't exist. Now, let's say I tell someone about some of these things that I know. I, can, I will never be able to tell someone everything that I have in my brain, all right? So, but here again, I can also, I, can, I can't tell all that I know, but if I tell it, it still is only going to exist for a, a short period of time, as long as the person I told it to it, it is around and they can tell someone else maybe. However, what the things that I write, or in this case, the things that I'm videoing, now I have transferred knowledge from my mind, from my brain, from other sources, <laughs> to a media that I've written down that can exist and can be replicated, you know, for hundreds and hundreds of years to come. So we always know more than we can tell, and we can tell, um, and we can always tell more than what we can write. So when we think about knowledge management, KM, what is it? Knowledge management, I'm going to read from the slide. You probably say, I don't do that often. No, I don't. It's the art of transforming information and intellectual intellectual assets and into an enduring value for organizations, clients, and its people. It's how do I get stuff out of, from between the two years into a format that's enduring. So some of the activities associated with KM is uh, knowledge creation and knowledge acquisition. How do you create knowledge and how do you acquire it? You know, how do, we, how do you bring knowledge in? Now, how do I share it and how do I transfer it? Uh, share it with coworkers and transfer it to a place where it can be <coughs> replicated or used again. And probably the final and the biggest part of that is the application side. How I now able to apply knowledge? Not just me, but I, now if I've acquired it, created it, and transferred it to others, are those others able to actually apply that knowledge in some tangible uh, fashion? And what is the purpose? Really, the purpose of, of KM foster the reuse of intellectual capital. And we're talking intellectual capital, again, would exist between these two ears. Uh, it's also, the, the purpose of that is to enable better decision making. You know, the, the, the more data I have, I can get better information, knowledge, and make better decisions. And, <coughs> and that's where innovation, that's where great ideas come from. You know, is the collection, is the collaboration uh, with, of knowledge. And right information, to the right people at the right time. Peter Drucker says this, you can't manage knowledge. I like this, knowledge is between two years and only between two years. Yeah, we can manage data, you know. If I got data in a database, I can manage it, I can move it. Same with information, and we can you know, manage information. But knowledge, think, that intellectual capital, until it is, it is exported out, how do, we, how do we manage that? You can't, it's between two years. So when we talk about that, though, let's talk about this uh, DIKW uh, maturity model. That's, that's what I'm thinking about. Uh, data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. Data, information, knowledge, wisdom. So if I start here at the bottom, right, I have a book. It could be any book. It could be a Bible. It could be a textbook, whatever it may be. What is that? That is just a bunch of symbols, a bunch of, bunch of letters. Uh, Data. That's all that is, is data. Doesn't mean anything. It, it, is, it is really meaningless. Can I manage this? Yes, I can close it. I can put it on a shelf. I can put it in my car. So yeah, I can, I can manage that, that data. However, let's not pick that up and I read it. I ingest that data. And, <coughs> and that data becomes, at that point, information. Oh, that's great. I've got some information. I just read a chapter in a book. I just read a verse in the Bible. And I'm like, wow, that's great. I've, got, I've gained some type of information. But it's not until I digest that that it becomes knowledge. It's like food, you know. I got I go to a buffet. That food on that buffet is it's just data. 
until I ingest it, I eat it. I put it in my mouth, chew it. But you know what? I enjoy the taste. I enjoy the flavor. I enjoy the experience here. However, it's not until that food is actually digested that it now becomes something tangible that my body can use. That becomes a fuel source, right? Because, and then at that point, now I'm able to apply this knowledge. Now I've ingested it, digested it, and now let's apply it. That's the wisdom level. And that's what we're talking about in this model as we mature. Uh, 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 <coughs> our information, our data to information, information to knowledge, and knowledge to wisdom. And now wisdom, that's now I'm able to act on this. I'm able to make decision quality, uh, uh, I've got decision quality data that I can make decisions with that will impact the outcome of the company, outcome of the business, or whatever it may be. So when we think about knowledge, another way to look at this, different knowledge types, and this is from the Knowledge Creating Company. Uh, this is from actually 1995. From two uh, Japanese business experts, Iku, <laughs> Iku, 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 Hiro, I'm sorry, Ikuhiro uh, Nononka and Hirotoka Takanuchi. Man, yeah, try saying that uh, three times backwards. Anyway, they were the first to tie the success of businesses to their ability to create new knowledge and to use it to produce successful products and technology. So they really, they were, uh, you know, kind of innovative in knowledge management from a business, from a business perspective. They came up with two types of knowledge, things they looked at, it, what they call explicit knowledge, and that's knowledge which has been encoded into some media external to a person. This video that I'm making, that you're watching, is explicit knowledge. Something that I've done, created, and I've put it into a, a format that's external of my brain. Explicit knowledge. Then there's tactic knowledge. And when we talk about tactic knowledge, that's knowledge that's stored within an individual, is personal, and is very context specific, right? That stuff is still up here that haven't gotten into a video yet. Explicit and tactic. All right, so let's let's let's, let's compare contrast what we're talking about here. <coughs> Excuse me. So we think about explicit knowledge. That's the rational part of our knowledge that can be expressed and easily explained in words and numbers. I Meaning, yes, I can. I, I've got a a paper, I got a white paper, you know, I got a research paper that I've written, easily explained, I can transfer that very easily. However, tactic knowledge, highly personal and hard to formalize, makes it difficult to communicate or to share with other people. There are things that people who have worked in your environment for the last 20 years, they may, you know, be that, that old guy, that old person on the job. So they're the ones who've got all this, this corporate knowledge, we call it. Very difficult to explain sometimes, but they just know how it works. Or like your, your grandmother, you know, who goes in the kitchen and can just whip up a meal from nothing. That's tactic knowledge compared to, you know, you, her grandson, granddaughter, you have to go grab a cookbook, which is explicit knowledge. That cookbook has knowledge in there, but it's been written down with words and numbers. So, but as opposed to your grandma who has tactic knowledge and she always oh, just show you this, you just put a little bit of this and that and you just put some of that and you mix it up. You know, you put the oven on, I don't know, about 350. And how long do you cook it? Well, you know, for a little while, you know. That's tactic knowledge. As opposed to cookbook, you know, three eggs, you know, two cups of sugar, a cup of, of, of bacon, um, of bacon, a cup of butter, cook, uh, set on 375 for 35 minutes. Explicit tactic. Also, when you think about this, the ability to disseminate, to reproduce, to access, and reapply throughout the organization. Again, that cookbook. I can pass that cookbook down from generation to generation, and everyone can make the same apple pie. However, tactic knowledge is its ability to adapt to deal with new and exceptional situations. Okay, because grandma, she just came in and said, well, I ain't got, I don't have as many eggs, but <coughs> I, I don't have a whole cup of, of, of milk. But you know what? I'm going to replace that because I do have some, uh, some canned milk up here. So on the fly, because of that tactic knowledge, still make the same thing, come out about the same, but is able to substitute this for this. Something that if you just have explicit knowledge, you're kind of lost. Able to train and teach. Yes, I can show you how to make this, this, this apple pie in this cookbook step by step. This tactic expertise or the know-how, the know-why, and the care-why. Things that live that isn't always so explicit. Able to, ability to organize, systematize, to translate a vision into a mission statement, into operational guidelines. Things that are very, very, um, you know, 
methodical within your organization. That's the explicit knowledge. The tactic knowledge is the ability to collaborate, to share a vision, to transmit a culture. This, I would say, is one of the hardest, is to share a vision. You know, when you have a vision and you see something and try to get other people to see it through the same lens or through the same eyes that you have. Now, once you do that, I, once I share the vision, now that share can become explicit because now someone can take that and translate it into a mission and say, oh, I see what he means now. I got it. Okay, now let's go write this down. That's why many times when you go talk to your boss, they seem to be very abstract. And it's like, and you, you wanted them to tell, tell me exactly what you want. And they can't tell you exactly what they want because it's up here. They're seeing it in their mind, <coughs> but having the as tactic knowledge and having a hard time explaining it to you so it can become explicit knowledge. Uh, transfer knowledge via product, services, or documented processes. Things that are, you know, you're, you're within your organization. You've got books, you've got guidelines, you've got standard operating procedures. All of these things are explicit knowledge. It tells you how to do things. Tactic knowledge, that's coaching, mentoring, you know, that one-on-one, -on -one, face to face you know, analogies, things that, that, that and from that perspective, that you just can't write down. You would love to, oh, man, I wish I could, wish I had written that down. That was just so powerful. But that was, you were receiving that tactic knowledge. I said, your explicit knowledge can be communicated to others very easily, whereas tactic deeply rooted in, in a person's experiences values, their emotions. So within an organization, you're dealing with both of these. And understanding how to, I won't even say, can you manage tactic knowledge? No, it's very difficult. But it's a skill set that if you understand it, now when I'm talking to my boss, I'm talking to that person who's been here for 20 years, who have a lot of experience, a lot of emotions, a lot of these things. Now, how do I take that gingerly, you know, absorb that out of that intellectual uh, mindset and now convert that to explicit knowledge by being able to write it down into a procedure into something to capture that that is the part <coughs> that many organizations struggle with and this is what the the knowledge creating company was was trying to grasp how do we get our arms around um, harvesting that intellectual capital that comes from tactic knowledge now two terms that are used a lot sometimes that we're going to talk about I am and KM. What is the difference between information management and knowledge management? So let's let's take a look at that. We're going to look at information, I am, KM. Information management relies on technical achievements to enable sharing, you know, some type of network, some type of um, <coughs> local area network or, or websites, things like that. That's how we share information. Knowledge management relies on the willingness of individuals. Someone has to stop and take the time to share what's in their mind with you, within their brain, within their heart, within their soul, their spirit. That's what knowledge management is. I am, uses firewalls, permissions. You know, yeah, we, I can control on our network who has access to what information, what files, what data. KM, actually, that's based on retention policy and circulation of knowledge. I mean, many times there's a shelf life associated with KM. And how... You, you, you get that knowledge circulated to everyone who needs it. Information management, again, very data-centric. Information is distributed, organized, you know, neatly stacked and racked. KM, human-centric. That's what the knowledge that resides in somebody's mind. So you see there is a fundamental difference between information managing information and trying to capture and manage knowledge. And one of the, the, the faulty paradigms that we have is with KM is that we don't, if we don't understand the difference, we'll get to this, this, this faulty paradigm and think we're managing knowledge. Because this is what we do. So you write your knowledge into a database, right? So I'm going to go interview, you know, someone or, or all the things I know, I'm going to put into a, a database. Yeah, we're going to make spreadsheets. We're going to, we're going to capture it in a database. Then what we're going to do, we're going to be sure that we got the right amount of detail in that database. So we got to be sure we got all of the, the fields and rows and keys and, um, that we need in this database. And then after we finish, we get all this stuff in there and hopefully somebody will use that someday. Maybe they won't. How many, think about it, in your organization, probably where you work today, how much data is sitting in databases that no one ever look at? No one even knows it exists, you know? But it's there. And this is how, and, and we think we are doing, we're managing knowledge. No, we're not. We're just doing data collection and storage. Well, I know how we'll fix the problem. 
we'll, we'll set up a wiki and a blog. No, is social media the answer? No, they're just tools. They are just tools. You know, if we, when we when we Google something, you know, look at Wikipedia. Is Wikipedia really managing knowledge? No, it has become again a very large database with stuff that's in there, but not really managing knowledge. It is housing information, just tools. That, do they look cool? Look smooth? Yes, they do. And so, so if, we, if I got this, you know, sweet looking wiki or website or blog up, still again, maybe somebody will see the, this information. Maybe they won't. Don't know. Here's a here's a here's a conundrum that we have, I think, in life now, but especially in many organizations. We we'll call it the the, uh, the ninety nine one rule. One percent of all web users create the majority of the content. You don't believe me? Go look at your Facebook site, your TikTok. Your, you know, you have a lot of people who are yeah people in that nine percent nine percent of web users comment and tag information. You know, the thumbs up, the like, the little heart. I loved it, loved it, you know. 90% of web users only consume information. Think about that. 1% of all the web users create the majority of the content. So think about how much intellectual property is getting lost. Every time someone leaves an organization, and every time someone, you know, passes away or what. That's that is intellectual property that is no longer available. So if you look in within your organization and that you're going to manage, how many of the knowledge holders in your organization are the one percent? That every time someone walks out of the door, how much knowledge just left? Now apply that ninety-nine one rule, you know, across your life, across your your what, what you do. One percent create, nine percent comment, the rest of them are just consumers. Well, maybe AI, you know, that's the big thing now. Artificial intelligence. Chat GPT is the answer, right? Well, I don't know. Let's talk about AI a little bit. Artificial intelligence and machine learning. I know these are two acronyms people. We throw them out there and they've almost become synonymous, right? Are they the same thing? Ah, no, they are not. There are some, some differences. Uh, between the two. Let's take a look at that. So when we think about AI, I've just did a quick comparison of AI and, and machine learning. What is AI? AI is a broad term for machine-based applications that mimic human intelligence. Not all AI solutions are machine learning. However, conversely, machine learning is an artificial intelligent methodology. So all your a machine learning solutions are AI solutions. And so they're, they're not mutually uh, inclusive. AI is best for completing a complex human task with efficiency. That's why it's like chat GPT, effective. Why? Because I want to write, I have a task to write a term paper. And I give it, you know, I want a paper on this subject. Well, AI is, can complete that task by going out and finding information it needs to. Machine learning is best at identifying patterns in large sets of data to solve a specific problem. Um, <coughs> think about machine learning. I want to know how many, um, what's the failure rate of um, the brakes on Toyota cars. So now, if you think about how many thousands of Toyotas have been sold and uh, exist across the planet, large data set. Now I'm able to extract data. I can, I can to have machine learning to go and start making calculations and looking at the data sets that show that, well, these failed, this, this and this and this happened when brakes fail. So now I can start solving the problem. How can I reduce brake failures on Toyotas? A specific problem set based on large data. AI may be used on a wide range of methods like, you know, rule-based or neural-based uh, networks, computer visions, you know, whereas people manually select and extract features from raw data and assigns weight so we can train the model within machine learning. It's like the example I use. Where now I'm going to build a model that will look at brake failures on this large set of data from Toyota, right? So now I can train that model to look and find what it needs to do. When you think about AI, it's a its, it's implementation depends on the task. It's often pre-built. Like I say, when we think about the task, I wanted to, to write a paper. That's the task, and it's and there's an API 
an application programming interface that is set up like chat GPT has an API, a web based API that now it can go in and, and perform that specific task. With machine learning, you have to train it a model. It's a model and you have to train it for that exist for that specific use case, like the Toyota example. So as you see, AI and machine learning are not the same thing. And you know and, and, and really what they do and how they function, you know, are two different roles. So when we think about uh, AI, it does. It provides the capability to expand, use, and create knowledge in ways that we haven't imagined. Now, three ways that it does this, you know, as you think about AI, is one with automation. So AI is great for automation, or you can substitute the role of humans in performing a task, like writing an article or data mining, you know, like here again, the chat GPT. That's where we've automated the process of, of writing an article because AI is able to go out and find you know, and surf the internet itself and pull the data put it together and, and write the article. It's also uh, another use case that we call conversational interface optimization. What that does, it enables humans and AI agents to augment one another to perform a task. You, you probably use this quite a bit on the internet, you don't even think about it. Customer service chat bots. You know, if you go to a website and they have the little, it usually pops up in the, in the lower right corner, hey, do you need help? And you know, it, it, it's a chat. Well, that chat now is AI, but there are still humans in the customer service departments of these organizations. Uh, so, so now the humans have set up, you know, the algorithms of how we want to answer the questions. But what also, if or if you go through that chat, and the chat gets to a place that okay, I can't make a decision. Now I'm going to hand you off to a human agent. Um, you get that on on you know telephone you know, calls now. You know, are you looking to press one if you want to do this? And I guess you. And then, but once that, that gets to the place that it has exhausted all of its resources to where I, the, the AI can't answer it, then it will hand you off to an agent. So you got conversational interface optimization where a blending or a, an augmentation of the human services with the AI agent. Other one, insight generation. This is where you have human and AI agents are dynamically brought together to perform a, some type of emergent task, like uh, financial advising. Or, or some you know, identifying trends. So when you look at a lot of your financial industry out there, they're really using this insight generation to be able to not only see what has been going on to now to start making you know predictions based on certain things or, or we see trends coming in this environment, but you still have the human interface you know to, uh, to, to help uh, with, 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 with that transaction. So we think AI it does. It, it, this is, these are some of the use cases that they, they really built it uh, to look at. Now, but does that mean that AI is the savior of the world for knowledge management, knowledge sharing? No, not really. I said, why? Information is only as is, is only a value if you can give it to the people who have the ability to do something with it. That was Jeremy Crystal. Yeah, I remember him uh, back in the day. So the reason we want to capture intellectual property, why? So we can share that. The thing you have to remember, though, knowledge sharing is always voluntary. No one can be forced. You know, you can't make me tell you, you know, the vision that I have in my head for something. Uh, we can share knowledge when we have the right audience that motivates us and creates the right context. But you can put me in the right environment, like in front of a camera with some slides behind me, and I will sit and spew, you know, for days. Why? The right audience and the right context. Um, and especially if you ask me a question. That way, I'm motivated because I see your motivation. You know, when it comes to, for me, personally, for knowledge sharing, I use the 401k system. I'm sure you're all familiar with your 401k plan you may have, right? That company, they will match your level of participation. If you don't um, participate, if you, if you don't provide income, uh, an input, they will not match anything. So I'm the same way. So yes, knowledge sharing can only be motivated uh, under the right situation, under the right circumstances. Social media, I think we've talked to that. No, alone social media is not the answer. Like I say, it's not the solution to the old problem of knowledge management. Having uh, more wikis, more websites, more blogs, you know, is not the answer. And yes, people perish due to what? A lack of knowledge. Not that it's unavailable, but they were an unwilling audience. The knowledge is always available if we know how to glean it uh, from them. Okay, so we've talked about several things here with respect to knowledge management. You know, we've gone over uh, the, the DIK W model, we looked at you know, the defaulty paradigms of different model, uh, model uh, different types. We've compared uh, information management and knowledge management, talked about knowledge sharing. So 
This is just a quick insight. Hopefully it was enough just to whet your whistle and your appetite that you can dig deeper into this thing called knowledge management because it is a colossal, it is a growing area of how to capture, um, store, and and share <coughs> intellectual property uh, with, with people within your, with the human aspect within your organization. Okay, we'll be back with another module right after this.